When you start living together in, in any form, or you've done long distance for a while, now you're moving in together. When you start uh, living together, inevitably other things take precedence over the erotic friction. That's just the way it goes. Right? And uh, it goes like that because when you look at the amount of sex you have in a day versus the amount of other things you have in a day, there's a specific trend towards not having sex most of the day, right? Well, while if you're just together for a weekend on occasion, or then it's a special time and you use that time for special things. You go places together, you have sex, you stay in bed, you, you know, you have a completely different set of circumstances. But because you have experience with that, you can, in fact, replicate those principles, and it's just going to take a bit of discipline because, of course, when you live together, particularly if you've never lived together, there's a fair share of time spent on the things that make a relationship good. Communication, uh, common uh, agreements on everything of, you know, like where your toothpaste is in the, in the bathroom to who makes the bed, how the groceries are done and so on and so on. So you have to uh, work mostly on the things that create the sameness. And the sameness is important for the relationship, but the sameness, of course, kills the erotic friction. So knowing that, though, you can, when you want the erotic friction, replicate the things that you already know how to do, spend time apart, and then make time to spend time together. And that's one of the main ingredients. Right? So maybe you spend all day together, and then you spend another day together and another day together, and at the end of three days, you're like, hmm, yeah. So go away. <laughs> go somewhere else. <laughs> Don't try and uh, rekindle the thing by spending more time together. Right? Just spend some time apart. Go out with people you know. Go out with people you know. Go on separate walks. Do separate things. And then when you come back together, treat it like you used to treat it. Meaning avoid the distractions of modern daily life when you want to have intimate time. You can check your email before and post on Facebook after, but you, you can spend some time away from the usual distractions and do the things that you used to do when you would have a weekend together. And that's how you keep it alive. You have a model that you can replicate, and in your bodies, you have memory of those times. You Actually, that's the only thing you have, right? Meaning you haven't lived together. So you keep that memory of that kind of engagement going in the body by creating those set of circumstances, even though now you're living together. But all it takes is to disconnect and then come back together. Right? Because, of course, when somebody's only there on the weekend, you arrange it accordingly. And that goes away when you live together. It's this on-tap intimacy, right, that actually kills the intimacy. So another thing is... Be very conscious of how you touch. Don't just randomly touch in the hallway because it's really cool to suddenly be together. And it's just like going by each other and, you know, and there's no more, oh, yes. Right? And we, we've done this here over and over and over where you start an engagement very formally and you only add touch when you can add touch consciously and not just immediately start rubbing the other person because that's the way to go. And um, all the practices that you've done here, you can do, formal or not so formal, right? Making the eye contact, connect, connecting the heart, sitting with each other, being quiet, looking at each other, touching in conscious ways for the sake of the interaction. All of that's always available and very useful. And then the final piece of advice around how do you successfully cohabitate uh, if you start it right away, it won't feel so weird to do it. Make time for meetings. Can't say enough about that. One of the absolute uh, sex killers is when you're constantly talking about logistics. Right? You don't have children, but you know, if you have children, people who have children know that. It's a constant, 
who picks whom up from where and did you pick up the milk and da 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 and so you have to have the discipline to have meetings in which you handle business so to speak the business of your life right? and uh, you do it maybe monday wednesday friday or you or maybe only have to do it once a week or something like that where you go okay who does what who handles which logistics what are the things we need to do and then for the rest of the time you discipline yourself to send each other messages or you keep a joint list in my household everyone keeps a list so and there's different groups for different people and anything that shows up goes in that list and it's a joint list so when that person is at the grocery store they can pull up what's needed um, and when you think about it, you just enter it there and you don't just blurt it out. And so that's, that's a very useful thing, in particular in a fresh relationship. Yeah, absolutely, right? There's nothing wrong with watching Netflix in your matching pajamas. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> just, just do yourself a favor and don't expect sex during that time. Right? It might happen spontaneously, there's nothing wrong with it, but just know that when you do that, you do that for the well-being of your body, and, you, and, and that is definitely true. If you have to go from daytime to nighttime, you're fucked, essentially. Right? So, yeah, don't just expect that that will be the day where suddenly, spontaneously, romantic things will show up. And uh, have your nuzzle time to the extreme, and then when you want to have sexy time, you'll you know spend some time apart and come back together. And when you have a few days off um, together, then you do something special with that. It's mostly about being aware of what can happen that makes it so it's not that big of a deal, because nobody needs to be polarized all the time. It's well, you know, why? It's not very useful. You, you definitely don't need to be polarized when you're grocery shopping, unless you really want to annoy people in the restaurant. Yeah. Oh, up, uh, you know, for, uh, at a certain age, this is a horrible thing to say, but, but at a certain age, you look a little bit stupid when you're constantly sucking face in public. <laughs> right? It's a bit like, really, guys? You don't have a room? You know, there's just something not right about it. Um, it's okay when you're 16 or, you know, something like that, but, and you don't have a room. So, you know. <laughs> so do the things that require, you know, good harmony and, and being resonant and enjoy that. But when you don't want that, then don't do that. And good luck. Who's moving in with whom? You're mo so you're moving town. Do you know people where she lives? Okay, good. Because that's another thing, right? Not having friends. So you're moving actually physically into her space. Have you uh, considered the, how to do that properly? Well, one of the ways to do it, if you wanna, if you wanna do it right, is you take everything out, and then you move your stuff in together because that makes a huge difference. Then he's not gonna feel like he's, uh, you know, just on on borrowed ground extended here, sleepover. extended sleepover. <laughs> So that's, that's actually a quite a, f a fun thing to do is to, you know, move all your shit out. It's a bit uh, disrupting, but that's a good thing. And then only move in together what you want to move in together and rearrange it so you both feel it's new. Have fun. <laughs> So this is just a matter of you are he he's running hot and you are still very cool. Okay. What could he do to bridge that gap? What essentially happens is there's a requirement placed on you that you can't fulfill, and that probably comes with a whole bunch of psychological stuff, you know, inadequacy and blah 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 blah. And then of course it hooks into his inadequacy, and then you know your insecurities are dancing the tango. And, and they are good at tango dancing, right? And it takes a while to wrench them apart. So there's a, you know, it's a joint effort, of course. Um, but it's a joint effort that can't be placed only on you. That's, you know, that's not useful. So things you can do, and then I'll say things you can do, right? So things you can do is know that um, she needs to be warmed up. And so... 
you'll have to just allot the extra time um, if you can keep your, you know, your cool long enough to warm her up, so to speak. You'll probably have a better chance, and you've learned a lot of things, and clearly they have worked because you haven't had that issue. It's just a matter of you remembering that 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 has to be your go-to, right? Bef- and not the other thing. That's the skill you've been meaning to learn, and now you have it. So that's that's something you can do. But you have to learn not to um, pop out. Right? And so that might take a bit of time. And so one of the ways that you can work with that is have a code word. And ideally a code word that's somewhat weird or bizarre or funny. I don't know if you can think of something. It's mayonnaise. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so instead of doing what you do, you'll say mayonnaise. <laughs> right? Clearly, there's something there that immediately breaks the, the, you know, the, the faint strings of the tango coming on. Right, so that's what we're after. Is that when the first bit of the what is what is that thing mm-hmm. that they play accordion. accordion? When the first strains of the accordion start to tinkle, you have to go mayonnaise, mayonnaise, right? <laughs> and then for some reason, I don't know why this is so horrible. Uh, you know Gary Larson. The cartoonist Gary Larson. Okay, if you don't know that, that makes no sense. Far side. My favorite cartoon of all times, I don't know why, is a, a cartoon where you see a guy open the fridge, and in the fridge is this, you know, this classic American glass bowl uh, covered with saran wrap, but the bowl has arms with guns and legs, and it says, when potato salad goes bad. <laughs> That's what I think when you say mayonnaise, right? <laughs> There's some, 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 you know, some guns blazing there. So you have, you have, to, uh, you have to catch that moment when potato salad goes bad, right? And say mayonnaise. That's all you need to say. Because then it's, it's clear that it's the dynamic and it's not for a lack of love or desire, between the two of you. It's, it's, a, it's a dynamic, and the dynamic has its own rules, and you have to break the rules of the dynamic. And so how you break the rules of the dynamic is you do different things than you would, you would usually do, because they clearly don't work. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, that we have established. You know, the sexy eyes don't work. Right? <laughs> so now you have touch and that kind of stuff. But you also can't do that diversion tactic that makes him feel like, you know, he's just undesirable and all of that. So when you say mayonnaise, you are acknowledging that, you know, the, fi- the faint accordion tinkling has started. And then you can laugh, and then from there, you can decide what you're going to do. That's how I would play this. <laughs> and it should be funny, right, and, and comical, and you get better at it. You'll detect the mayonnaise quicker. And In general, right, this dynamic probably happens in other areas too, ever so slightly. You'll you'll see, you know, mayonnaise shows up different places. Name it, Mm. right? When when these things happen, just name it. Mm. And then maybe you can do something about it. Maybe you can't in that moment because these things take time. But at least it's spoken. And that takes a lot of the, you know, the, the, the bite out of it. But you always come back together. And when you come back together, the polarity... And you, you're breaking up because the polarity is weak. I'm, uh, I'm not sure how much I can say about it because I don't know your entire situation, right? For some people, it really works to live separately. But it's no guarantee. And what I mean by that is... There's huge advantages to not living in the same space, and then there's huge disadvantages. 
And so you have to feel where you sit in the relationship, where that is rejuvenating or destabilizing further. Now, it's not a problem for a relationship to get destabilized further if the relationship isn't working as it is. And you don't have children. So if you had children, I certainly would not suggest you move apart, right? Unless it's really grave, simply because it's not fair on the kids. And, you know, unless you really want to break up, then you, should, of course, should move. But since you're not having children... Um, Here are some pitfalls. When the polarity isn't very strong and you want to create more polarity, you know, and you do move apart, then you have to make sure that when you come together, you do so with great intention. So you can't just move apart and then spend every evening together at somebody's place. That's, you know, it's useless. Then you might as well save the rent and stay together. You, you have to essentially create distinct lives from which you come together when you actually want to come together. The, the danger is that you m might find that you have very different rhythms once you've created your own lives. Right? So maybe you just stay up really, really late and you know, you're not available uh, you know, in the morning and you're certainly not available in the evening uh, till you are done with everything and by then she's really tired or something like that. Right? So, so those kind of situations can happen where you then create so much of an own life that, you know, why even bother? That, that's something to really seriously consider because that can happen. Where you, uh, and the other thing that can happen is that when you move apart, there's a certain kind of insecurity and jealousy about the creating of the own lives that makes it very hard to be together. Those are also things to consider. Right? But that all considered, sometimes it can be really useful to do that because it forces you to actually feel and look what you are about and what your relationship is about and what kind of value you bring to a relationship. And then you will really see what the relationship's made out of when you're no longer just doing the habitual stuff. No. I really can't stress enough that mm, you need to be very, very clear on what you're accomplishing. No. Because it might be that that's the end of the relationship, but it might also be that's the end of the relationship if you stay together yeah. in the same space. That's the, that's the caveat there. But, you know, I know lots of people who, who are even married and they don't even live together, and it works great. But it works best for people who are somewhat unconventional in their lives. And when you're saying you're both working from home, that makes things a bit better because you are not as tied into a regular schedule um, as other people. And that gives you a lot more flexibility on when to get together and what to do. Well, if you do a daily movement practice like you have been yes. doing, just... Okay, so... There's two ways that you could go at that. One of which is that you figure out what kind of man do you want and what kind of flavor would this man enjoy. Right, so what are the things that the man that you would want would want from you? And then in your daily movement practice, you tend to those aspects of you. And there's a big you know, a big caveat here. You're not trying to make yourself into something you're not, but you're expanding um, your already available uh, repertoire within who you are, right? So that's very important. You don't want to make yourself something that you're not. But let's just say, um, well, I know that you're an incredibly competent woman in your life, right? And comp being competent and being meticulous and detail-oriented and all of those things come with your job and with your life. So um, I would assume that you probably would want a partner who is that. And um, that partner then, of course, sexually speaking, would not want that from you because it's polarity. 
So if you want a guy who's not some sloppy, go with the flow, uh, unwashed, uh, sandal wearing hippie, you know, to to go with the stereotype or surfer boy, where you where you live, it's surfer boy. Uh, you know, if you don't want a surfer boy, then sexually speaking, you'll have to be the surfer girl because it's the opposition of things. So you'll have to bring the energetic, full, alive parts of yourself to the meticulously organized and directed part of him. Right? If that's how you want to play. So the things that you value in a man um, and that he would value in you as a partner are not the things that he would value sexually. So one of you has to be less structured sexually. And so if you do a lot of structured stuff in your life, as you do, then your movement practice would be, as it is, to be unstructured. You have that floppiness as, a, as an anti-venom to your organized structure itself so that's one way that you can do it the other thing you can do in a movement practice is you can do actual calling in where you're essentially moving to the relationship so like moving what you're feeling but you're moving what you're feeling to the relationship so you move you feel what kind of relationship you want and you move your body in response to those feelings of the relationship so that your body starts becoming used to the things that you are looking for. So when you actually see them, your body can recognize them. So that it's like an instant recognition where your body goes, huh, before your mind can go there. Because for the most part, uh, the, those things don't look quite the same way they feel. Right, and we're often attracted to things that are not actually good for us based on previous imprints. So it's a good idea to imprint your body with the kind of feelings and sensations and open your body to the kind of thing you really want versus the default that came from your last relationship or your parents, or things of that nature. This is actually a very good question because this hap you know, people have these questions and there's a lot of really strange ideas out there. I'm not saying you have them, but like the, you know, how to bring the feminine to business. Well, the, you know, that's a bit of a weird thing to consider because what we are talking here is sexual polarity, right? Sexual attraction, erotic friction. It's between people who want to have sex. That's, that's what we're dealing with. And we spent all week teaching you layers and layers and layers and layers so that you can do that. However, and this is, the, this is why it's such a good question, of course these dynamics exist anywhere there's people. right? And um, in the workplace, it is actually good to know that they exist so you don't fall into the traps that come with strong erotic friction. Because erotic friction... It has nothing to do with personal uh, preferences, as you've all found out, because you created erotic friction at will to greater and lesser degrees, but you created erotic friction at will with people you probably would not do that with in your regular life, right? So, which is important to know because these principles are so strong that they take people out, right? The, the classic... Um, uh, well, you know the classic one of spiritual leader and student, right? Or um, professor and student or uh, doctor and patient. You know, those kind of things, they, they follow these very strong tidal poles, so to speak, that are almost, most people can't, can't deal with them because they're not equipped, right? So that said, uh, polarity and and. and and that opposites attract, of course, happens in the workplace. But like you said, when you know the principles, you can use the principles to neutralize. Right. So there's ways to do that because, of course, if you have a, let's say, male or female, doesn't actually matter, but a work colleague, and it's exactly what you say, they're like all in the flow, right? And 
now you get all in the flow because you're trying to resonate and nothing gets done, then you will have to say, okay, I'm going to get shit done. And then depending on the relationship, that will resonate the other person into also getting shit done. Or they stay where they are and then you will have a tension and it's not necessarily erotic. It's just tension, right? Because it's not an erotic relationship. Um, and of course, it could create an erotic relationship if you have a female coworker who is always a total chaotic mess and you start aligning her, so to speak, you will have erotic tension just through the mere, you know, dynamic. But if people are somewhat healthy around it and that isn't how you always do it, you can polarize or resonate somebody. And in an ideal world, you want to resonate them. So the difference between polarizing somebody and resonating him is that you would feel them and you would essentially connect with them like we're doing here as well, but not, not to that you know, extreme. But you would make yourself available to the interaction. You would connect your heart so that you can actually feel them and then you're bringing them along into resonance versus making yourself different for the sake of the polarity. So what that means Technically speaking, you, you described it already, but I'm just putting words to it, is that you only give a tiny little bit more of what they don't have so that they can follow you because they are with you. But that, what that requires is the intimacy so that they're with you. And that's the key, how you take it out of the sexual uh, you know, department into a work environment, is that you actually... Uh, attempting to assimilate with them, right? So you're, you're like literally resonating together and they start following your lead. So how you do that is by feeling them, connecting with them, having intimacy in the sense that you feel where they're at and they can feel you and then they'll follow you. So, and then that way you can avoid the pitfall of the strong polarization that leads to all kinds of funky business. Yeah. Hashtags, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And of course, it's much easier when it's uh, same, you know, same sex, it, unless they're, you know, uh, polled different than you, um, than it is in an opposite sex relationship. But it can be done in an opposite sex relationship too, and it's the, it's the becoming resonant. So one of the ways you, we do this here inadvertently, and sometimes you see that, you guys actually didn't do much of that. But sometimes when the women start moving and the guys are holding structure, the guys get entranced in the women's movement. It's like this, the women are like snake charmers. The guys, mm -hmm. the guys are starting to weave back and forth with, with the women, right? Because it's so compelling and they resonate. Well, you can use that, of course, when you want to resonate somebody, you start moving with them, so to speak. Right? You, you feel their body, you feel their mechanisms, you feel their mannerisms, and you kind of enter with them. And then from there, once you resonate, you move it to where you need to move it. Considering that most relationships don't work, Right? When, you, when we look at the current divorce rate, and that's just the divorce rate. So that's people who were essentially willing to go there. We're not even considering all the people who never made it there, right? who broke up before that happened. Um, and when you, we look at the, the relationships that are intact and the amount of cheating that's happening... Right? And we're talking actual cheating, not just internet porn and whatever, happy endings and stuff like that. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a fairly dire outlook on the state of relationships as it is. Right? And there are several people out there in the, in, the, in the book and speaker circuit who talk about this at great length. Right? And we just did a conference up at uh, 1440 uh, Multiversity where they had two people from the Kinsey Institute, two researchers. Mm -hmm. And when you look at some of those statistics, it's pretty wild, right? Um, 
don't think there has ever been more single people in America ever. This guy, he's a professor at the Kinsey Institute, or the the the, the, the actually is the is he, is he the chair or the director of the Kin yes, Kinsey yes. Institute? Um, he consults for Match.com, so he's got like really interesting uh, statistics. His name is Justin Garcia, if you want to look him up. He's actually really great and f very funny and very accessible. You saw him, yeah. yeah. And so did you, right? Yeah, you saw him too. So, so when you look at the statistics, it doesn't look like the people who talk about the relationships are actually making good gains in the realms of relationships. And it's always hilarious when you see people who've just gotten married. Um, I knew... Oh, God, this is so horrible... <laughs> I had some people here once for a workshop who were in such dire straits in their relationship dynamics, but then they got married right after they came to the workshop. They came to the workshop stealthily because they were both uh, coaches, big coaches. And so they came to fix things before they got married. They didn't fix them because they were absolutely unfixable. But then they got married. And as part of their wedding, they offered all their other equally delusional coach friends a two-day seminar on how do you create the kind of powerful power couple um, relationship that they have. And every, yeah, I know, everybody flew in and it was this big deal that didn't last a year. Right. I mean, and, and, and really horrific shit. So, so I'm saying this to say there's lots of people lording it over you with their great relationships who really don't have great relationships. The people who have great relationships, for the most part, don't talk about them. They just have them. Right. And, and they, they have other things to do with their lives. So the Swahili part is probably at least partly because... Um, it's bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Human beings are meant to be in partnerships and have relationships and all of those wonderful things. Mm -hmm. So that's out of, that's not the question. The, the question isn't should you have the kind of relationship you want that nourishes you in the ways a relationship can nourish you. Absolutely, you should have it. But you might want to consider that it doesn't look the way people and you yourself looks because a lot of people find usually after their first divorce or some really catastrophic breakup when they're honest that the things that they want for themselves if they're really honest don't look conventional right they just don't look conventional and I have several uh, couples I've worked with over the years who have somewhat open marriages but not in the sense that, you know, it is in the Bay Area where everybody's got like fucking, you know, tertiary partners or whatever, you know, eight down the line and, and, and you fuck for 10 minutes and you have to process for eight hours, right? <laughs> and it's, it's you know, it's, it, it doesn't work. But there is people I know, quite a few, who have arranged themselves in a way that there's other things happening that are not spoken about because there's a general, uh, you know, trust and agreement and it's really, really cleanly kept. That takes a lot of maturity, but it's possible. The same way it's possible that you have a relationship with someone with whom you don't share the kitchen or the grocery store and they're equally happy with that as you are. And they, they're not necessarily men you have to share with many other women, you know, even though if men would be really, really honest, most men you do have to share with other women. Either, either that's said openly or it takes on some other forms, but good men are hard to find to begin with and good men who only want to eat pizza for the rest of their lives every evening, uh, you know, are very, very rare. So that's not to say that everybody needs to be polyamorous, but it takes all kinds of different forms where every partner has the freedom to be expressed the way they want to be expressed. So the key here is not to say, well, how long is it going to take me till I'm normal, right? But instead, and you want to get cracking with this rather sooner than later, because in women, sadly, these things have age limits. Not, not the hard age limits, but in, in certain hormonal stages and in certain times of your life, you're going to need different things and you're also going to attract different men and that's 
the sad truth, right? Because you with uh, 50 are not going to want to date a 60-year-old man or even a 50-year-old man for that matter. You with 50 are probably going to want to date a man between 35 and 45. But Mr. 35 to 45, who is like a real amazing guy, can date from legal age up to sure death. Right? So he's got the entire, but he's going to want to date way younger than you, simply because of the biological aspect of things. So th- those are some hard and not very pleasant truths to consider when one is a woman. Mm-hmm. Men have other things to deal with, right? But, but so defining who you are and what you actually want and then actively putting that out there is your best ticket and not wait till you're fully baked in some delusion of what it looks like, right? And I would venture to guess that you'll find more men who go, oh, cool, Great woman, wants to have lots of sex, wants to have adventure, um, is happy and open, but really wants a lot of space and I don't have to live with her. I don't think you're going to have that hard of a time to find them. You just have to look for them outside of the poly uh, context because those guys hide. Right? It's very, very easy to hide when you have multiple partners because you don't have to actually you know, put the rubber to the road anywhere. Specifically, you know, you can just fuzz out to the next and the next and the next. But if you find a man who, in general, is interested in engaging deeply, but he also has lots of other interests that might not even be aligned with yours or that are solitary, you're good. It's always tricky. It's never not tricky. And when it's not tricky... Which, some, you know, sometimes there's by the grace of God, right? You've, you have that unicorn, and we talked a little bit about that. But there's more than one unicorn, too. Uh, it's a matter of being crystal clear on what you can handle and what you can't handle and not compromising in the lead-up. Because one of the things that women get trapped in eternally is the guy who's almost it, potential. And potential is lethal, no. If you have to wait for any part of that guy to grow up or, be, or come around, it's not going to work. It's just not. No. So that's the key there is that you don't wait for the man to mature into the man that is the right man for you. But he's got like 95%. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you can hang around for the last five. You'd be surprised. And mind you, the only reason why you feel alone is that most women don't allow themselves to be honest about that because it completely busts the myth that we were all raised with, yeah. right? And, but it's a myth. It hasn't worked for anyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, in, in our parents' generation, there were some people who arranged themselves because there were no other options and arranged themselves well. Like my parents are still very happily married. But that was a different time and place, and they got together fairly young. And that makes a big difference because you actually you don't come fully formed. You grow together, and you raise children together, and you have really strong common goals. But I'm pretty sure my parents... If I would ask them, I might have to do that, didn't have the kind of goals that I have, right, for relationship. Their their goals were pretty clear cut and they were very beautifully aligned. And so um, it's it's totally doable and you can have a really good long term relationship when you're properly aligned. But you, you really need to know what it's what it's about and not just think oh happily ever after white wedding it's gonna be great afterwards you know well other than affirmations right which is always good but it's a very incomplete set of circumstances you have to move your body you you do a daily practice in which you orient your body towards the feeling So let's stick with commitment, right? You are afraid of commitment, but somehow you would like somebody who's just into you. Not you and Mary and Grace, right? Um, It can take other forms too, right? Like 
you know, not com commitment in how you understand it. Mm -hmm. Somebody who actually genuinely wants to be with the entirety of you and not you on a Tuesday evening, right? Only on a Tuesday evening. And then you have all the fears why that's not going to happen for you, blah, 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 blah. All of that's there. But when you think about the desire for the commitment, or however you want it, the desire for that particular engagement, before the thing kicks in that makes you go, oh, right, there's a moment of an opening. So what you do is you physically, like we did here on hands and knees, or you can also do it standing, move that feeling. So, so you, you, you find that feeling, and when you have that feeling, when you have a taste of that feeling, you start moving that feeling in your body. And then you'll see, then you'll pop out into, but, you know, then I'll give myself up to this wonderful relationship, and then he'll leave, right? And then you'll move that feeling, and then you come back to it. But no, how would it be if that wasn't happening? And, you, and that's how you create actual receptors, because you're bathing your cells with the sensations of the well-being or, or, or whatever, love, or whatever it is that it creates in you, so that you are more capable of receiving it, but also so you can, know, so you can actually feel it in someone. Because right. one of the uh, nice things when you are not so committed yourself is you find somebody who will act that out for you. Right? So you can go, well, I'm really committed to this guy, but he's not committed to me. Well, if he suddenly would commit to you, you'd be the one doing the running. Right? So it's, it's, he's the convenient scapegoat for your own unwillingness. And so how you, but you attracted him, of course, for that reason. So when you kind of move your body with that feeling over and over and over, when you meet a guy who actually has the, that feeling to him, that committing feeling to him, you'll be able to recognize him. Versus thinking that the guy that looks like he will commit, but, you know, of course he doesn't because you, you want him, so that means he won't. Right? Because these things are from the childhood. You, you, have, better, you have better sensors. So that, that's the main practice, is moving your body with the feeling of the joy of the commitment and bringing it back, bringing it back, bringing it back every time you pop out. It might also be a good idea to investigate um, this reluctance to commit because it may be, there may be a good reason for it. For instance, a lot of men who are divorced, as an example, are very reluctant to commit again you know, because they don't want to lose half of the half they've got left, you know, for instance. And uh, <laughs> because, you know, imagine you're in a situation where you're in a relationship with somebody and it goes so sour and so bad and they end up doing, in your opinion, such terrible things to you and becoming so vicious and horrible that it's traumatic. It's, it's like looking at the face of evil or malice, raw malice coming towards you. It can be very traumatizing. And then um, you have sort of seen a terrible thing and how do you proceed from there? Well, some men in this example, just using a different example to your exact example, say all women are like that, you know. And that's not necessarily a very functional uh, takeaway, but it's understandable. Other guys say, well, that's the only one, you know. She's the only one. I just need to find someone else, um, and I won't, that won't happen to me again, you know. And they rush into the next marriage or whatever it is real, real quick. And, of course, the same thing can happen to them in that case. It's, not, it's also not so functional a takeaway, right? But the, the hard part is this middle road, which is that any woman I meet, let's say you're out dating again as a, as a divorced man, right? Any woman I meet could be the next she-demon from hell, you know, <laughs> lying in court about me and taking all my shit and making me want to kill myself. But, but maybe she isn't. It's very, very hard because you've eaten, so to speak, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and now you're out of the garden. You're no, no, no longer naive. And to integrate a tremendous shock to your previous way of seeing the world, it, it takes uh, a lot of doing. To try and make that middle road, it's really difficult to do it. It doesn't work just to sort of cast aside the fear of commitment 
as an example, because there may be very good reasons why you're reluctant to commit. That you, you, you don't want to disarm yourself of those reasons, but you perhaps need to integrate those reasons if you're finding that you're not able to navigate past that point. And how do you do that? Well, you know, perhaps good old-fashioned therapy. Yeah. Go and say, I have fear of commitment. I want to unpack it. I don't know if I want to be in a relationship or not. I'm not even sure. If, I'm not asking to be sort of led in that direction. Mm-hmm. But I just want to um, investigate it and see what's going on there. What am I actually afraid of? Why am I afraid of it? This sort of thing. It is a burden. Relationship is a tremendous burden and a tremendous loss of freedom. It's, the question is, is it worth it? for the loss of the freedom and the sacrifice of, of all that and the extra burden. It's not, you can't really get around that. You can't have a kind of carefree, easygoing, as free as before sort of situation. Not, not permanently anyway. Because relationships don't work like that. You know? yeah. Even the best relationship involves a certain sacrifice of freedom uh, for one. But that may pay you more than it costs you. Depends on the person, depends on you, depends on why, you want, why you're doing it, what the relationship's for, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And then there's, there's an equation there. In other words, another way of putting it is, why do you want a relationship? What is the point of the growth? What's all this growth for? Okay, well, that's actually fairly, I'd say that's fairly clear. Possi- well, I mean, it depends what you mean by all that. But let's, let's say that that is as clear as, it's, as, 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 as you're saying it to be. You want to... You be in a relationship where there's, it's a cauldron of growth for the service to God. Okay. Then you have to decide if the chap that you're, you've got in your sights is an appropriate growth modality or the relationship you'll create together would be an appropriate growth modality. And then you have to decide if you're willing to pay to be involved in that accelerant. And then what happens when you grow out of, grow out of your old shoes? You, know? you just take them off, put them in the bin, right? And then the, the next guy. Maybe. Or maybe he goes with you. But if you're talking about growth, that's tremendously unstable, yeah. unpredictable. Who knows where it might go? So you're really leaping into the unknown, holding the hand of some other person. Yeah. And that's fine if, that's, if you know what you're doing. That's, that's fine, but it might not last. Yeah. It might cost you a lot. Depends what service to God means. Because servants don't tend to call their own shots. It's like, you know, go and empty the trash, servant. You know? <laughs> you're impinging on my freedom. Yeah, that's the entire point. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised how far praise goes. Right? You probably have a pretty good idea what kind of praise he would like that he never gets because it's the very thing that you usually don't give him either. Right? That's how it goes in a relationship. Right? Or let's put it this way. Your complaint with him, if transformed into praise, is probably the kind of praise he never gets. Nothing's worse for a man than when you complain. <laughs> right. So when you stop the complaint and you transform the complaint into some form of praise or at least openness to him doing things differently, then he can actually give you those things because it's a really, really touchy thing. If you say to a guy, I wish you'd touch me more, and then he touches you more in your mind or even loud, depending on what devil rides you in that particular moment, you're going to say, you're only touching me because I told you so. This is called a double bind, by the way. It's what drives people mad, literally. It's considered that a double bind is what causes schizophrenia. He's in a very touchy position when you say, do this. Because if you do it, if he does it, you're going to believe he only did it because you said so, and it means less. If he doesn't do it, he's an asshole. Right? So he has no way out. It's a little bit like with the you know, back scratching. It's like you can't do right at that point. So it will drive you mad. So when you, when you drop all of that, things can magically um, appear. And in general, and this is for anybody with any partner, future or present, generosity is really the thing that makes, is the, is the kind of the grease that keeps it all going. And most people don't want to be generous because they don't want to be f- feeling like um, the person then gets lazy or um, complacent. Or... But in this case, right, you, you do want to do that. You want somebody to be full, well-fed, abundant.
One of the other things that happens is you have an idea, but you don't have a destination, but which has also to do with the fact that you've been uh, thwarted in your aim to reach the destination. So this is by no means a you are doing something wrong, right? It's a it's a complicated feedback mechanism, right? In the beginning, you might have known exactly where you wanted to take her, but she didn't want to go there. So then you go, well, I'll take you somewhere. And she'll go, no, right? And, and then it becomes very muddled. But um, when you notice that you know where you want to take her and you have a good feeling for that and you take her and it's there, wherever there is, right? Even if it's just out on the balcony to look at the stars, it builds a certain kind of a trust and a feedback mechanism in the body where she'll go, oh, he, he actually knows where it's going and I like it there, Right? but also in non-sexual situations that lend themselves to building that trust um, where, I don't know, you're trying to fix something or whatever together, right? You're trying to hang a picture and, and nobody wants to take over and so nothing gets done, but you're both trying to take over but not. And somebody got to be in charge and somebody needs to follow. So when you then take the lead and she does follow, that gives a certain kind of a relief in the system. Or the other way around. Maybe she's better at it and she takes over and you go, oh, God, thank God, I just couldn't be bothered. Right? Either which way, it's fine, but you'll start noticing the dynamics of leading and following in your regular life. But in the beginning, you just play with it. Because one of the things with all the practices we've done here is there is the practices which are fairly simple and clear-cut, what makes them not simple or clear cut are two aspects. One, you don't have the muscle, which is why repetition comes in and feedback and you know and all of that. And the other one is you have some kind of um, reaction to it or contraction to it. And the only way that you can work on either is by doing it. You're not going to know why you don't want to do this thing till you do it and it pops up and then you can engage with the why behind. Thank you for listening to the Michaela Bohm podcast. Michaela's first book, The Wild Woman's Way, published by Atria, Simon & Schuster, is available in hardcover and audiobook on August 21st, 2018. To pre-order your copy, click the link in the show notes below.